Turn to the person next to you and say, what's up, neighbor? <laughs> you know, if I had to put my childhood into just a few pictures, it would be, no doubt, G.I. Joe's, Transformers, and Mr. Rogers. You know, my, my grandma, she had one of those old wooden TV sets. You know what I'm talking about? The old wooden box TV on the spinner. And I would come home, and it was PBS, and Mr. Rogers would be there. And, and for 31 years, Mr. Rogers taught us about life's big questions. He helps us, helped us to deal with life's big situations, like how to get over the first day of school jitters, what to think about things like war and divorce and racism. And Mr. Rogers truly believed that all of the world's biggest problems The cure for everything that ails us is found in being and having a good neighbor. And I wonder, could Mr. Rogers be right? You know, um, it's interesting. I've been reading a book lately called The Art of Neighboring. And it's written by two pastors that are here in the Denver area. They both had churches up near the Arvada area. And these, these pastors were really trying to figure out how to connect with the, their city and how to serve their city. And so they started having, having conversations with their city officials, uh, Dave Runyon and uh, Jay Patek. And they went and met with the mayor. And they, they said, okay, if you had a magic wand and you could just wave your magic wand, what would you want this city to look like? And the mayor gave this great list of all of these things. Let's get rid of crime. Let's take care of single moms. Let's provide things for the elderly. And let's have better systems and programs. And then in passing, the mayor looked at the group of people around the table and said, actually, if you guys could just figure out how to be better neighbors, then all, everything else will really kind of fall in the line. And nothing could actually impact our community more. Isn't that interesting to think about that when we ask somebody, like, what do we need to fix the world? You ask somebody in your friend circle, you ask somebody at work or somebody on the street, hey, how do we make this world a better place? They're going to say things like better systems and better programs and better politicians and all of these things, better economy, better structures, better roads. But could it be that we need to start with being good neighbors first? So Jesus one day, Jesus and his disciples were out. We read about this in Matthew chapter two, 22. And there, there was a group of people called uh, the, the scribes, and they were referred to as lawyers in kind of that first century Jewish culture. And these men spent their entire life studying the Hebrew Old Testament, studying the Torah, and they could be the official spokesperson for what the law said you should do. And so they loved to try to trap Jesus because Jesus was teaching all these things that ruffled their feathers. So they would go up to Jesus and they would ask him questions to try to trap him. And in Matthew 22, we see this very thing happen. Notice what happens in Matthew 22. This lawyer walks up to Jesus and says, Teacher, which is the, greatest, the great commandment of the law? Now, if you have maybe heard in a Bible study or spent some time hearing about the Old Testament law, there were 613 laws. And so he says, hey, which one of the 613 of those laws is the greatest? And notice what Jesus says. He says to him, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and all the prophets. Jesus says you can take everything that was written in the Old Testament. All that God said, and you can sum it up in two things. First, love God with everything you have. And two, love your neighbor as yourself. See, Jesus speaks about this idea of being a good neighbor. But what does it mean to truly be a good neighbor? I don't know about you guys, but I, I, I love the State Farm commercials. Jake from State Farm. I love the very first one. They're like, hey, what, what, Jake, what are you wearing, Jake, from State Farm? He's like, uh, khakis. You guys remember that one? One of my favorite commercials was when um, Jake is, he answers the door, and there's a pizza delivery person, right? And she's like, Jake, you saved me so much money on pizza. Here is pizza, and then here is a side of ranch. 
That's a, at my house, that would be a side of ranch. But, you know, it's like, what does it mean to be a good neighbor? Is it just to be there, to have a clean yard, to make sure your trash cans are put up after the 24-hour window, right, to respond if the HOA sends you a note, to say hello when you go to the mailbox? Is that what it actually means to be a good neighbor? So, so research has done a lot of social science around what it looks like to be socially connected and this furthering, disconnected world we live in. And it's really interesting. There's so many study, studies have been done, but one of the studies that was really interesting, it found that neighborhoods that were socially connected, many neighbors knew each other, that neighbors were connected, had each other's phone numbers, they were friends, that crime rates decreased by 40%. It's pretty big, right? 40%. Another study showed that people, who li- people will live longer when they're surrounded by people that they know and people that they love and that love them. Also, another study, this one was released in the Child Development Journal, showed that young people who grow up in communities where neighbors are engaged and supportive are less likely to engage in risky behavior and more likely to achieve positive academic and social outcomes. Like, those are pretty good results, Right? Like I think all of us would say, yeah, that's really good. Like, we want more of that. But the inverse is also true. Research shows that people who are disconnected, who aren't engaged with their neighbors, are isolated, are fearful, and have a misunderstanding of the people that live right next door to them. So it turns out that what Jesus says, the most important thing for us to do, to love God and love others, actually is the most important thing that we need to be good neighbors. But so how do we actually do that? That's what we're going to spend the next few weeks doing, is discussing, diving into this idea of who we're supposed to be as neighbors. And we've called our series, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Because we, whether you realize it or not, your neighbors who live next door or upstairs in the same complex that you live in, they may not know it, but they are asking you to be their neighbor. There's nothing more than we need is the people around us to be our neighbor. Nothing more than they need is for us to be their neighbor too. So today I want to ask the question then, okay, then who is my neighbor? If you have your Bibles, grab those. We'll be in Luke chapter 10 today. And we're going to be looking at a familiar story that many of you know if you've spent time in church. If, if, if you, know, you don't have much of a background in church, you've probably heard something about this parable. And what, here's what I want to ask you, though. As I read this parable, I want you to pretend you've never read it before. I want you not to impose what you think it says. But I want you to learn what Jesus is teaching us here. So similar situation in Luke chapter 10. There's another lawyer who walks up to Jesus, and he tries to trap Jesus again, and he asks Jesus a similar question in Luke 10. It says, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. So he's challenging Jesus. Is Jesus going to get this question right? And so he said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So that's the question. He says, Jesus, what do I need to do to go to heaven someday? And Jesus, like only Jesus does, he turns back around and he answers this question with a question. And he says, well, well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And so the the man answers, well, he gives him the answer that Jesus wanted. He said, well, you should love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He may have been at the previous conversation that Jesus told him that. And so Jesus says to him, you've answered correctly. Do this. And you will live. Listen to that. Do this and you'll have life. Remember, he asked about eternal life. What do I need to do to to have eternal life, to have salvation, to to go to heaven someday? And he says, do this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with everything you have. You will live. And so notice what happens, though. The, The man, he tries to justify himself. He tries to find a loophole. And he says, okay, well, if eternal life and, and, and salvation and all that is dependent upon how I treat people, well, I want, to, I want to feel like I'm doing a good job. So then he says, okay, Jesus, so then who is my neighbor? Now, none of us in this room would, would probably do this, but I think a lot of us in life, we tend to look for loopholes. We tend to look for things that we're already doing to make ourselves feel just a little bit better, right? 
Somebody's like, man, I've been going to the gym. And you're like, yeah, man, I go to the gym too. Oh, really, you do? Where do you go? Well, I nicknamed my bathroom the gym. So I just, every morning, I'm going, right? Like we try to find little loopholes. That was a terrible joke, by the way. I won't tell that one again. But by, 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 we always try to find these little loopholes to make ourselves better. And so the, the man says, well, who is my neighbor then? Is it people that look like me? Is it people that talk like me? Is it people that think the same way I think? Because I can tell you, I've been loving them really, really well. So notice what Jesus answers with the parable of the good Samaritan. Jesus says this in in Luke chapter 10, verse 30. He says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and it fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to that place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, this would have been shocking for the hearers because priests and Levites were the superheroes of that culture. These were guys that honored God, that lived righteously. These were guys that for sure would have stopped and helped the man who was lying in the ditch. But they clearly had something else to do. They were clearly in a hurry. They clearly couldn't be interrupted. They clearly didn't want to slow down. And so they passed by on the other side. They had schedules to keep, so they failed the test. But the Samaritan, Jesus says in verse 33, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Now, that would have been shocking because the Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews. They were enemies. Now, the Samaritan would never stop and help a Jewish person. Nor would a Jewish person ever stop to help a Samaritan. But Jesus says, this Samaritan stopped. In verse 34, he went to him and he bound his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to the inn, which would have been like the hospital in those days, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him. And whenever, whatever you, more you spend, I will repay when I come back. So Jesus tells this shocking story. To us, it kind of loses its translation. But to them, they're like, man, it'd it'd be impossible for that to happen. It'd be like a Bears fan and a, hold on, how'd that go? It'd be like a Broncos fan and a Raiders fan. You're not gonna stop and help them on the side of the road, right? But Jesus says, no, the Raiders fan stops. And he actually helps up the man in the Broncos jersey. So they would have been shocked. They would have said, no way. And so then Jesus says this. He says, okay, so, so crowd, listen, lawyer, who do you think was the better neighbor in this situation? Notice what he says. What's he going to say? He says, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. You notice what Jesus says here. He says, your neighbor isn't just who looks like you, talks like you, who acts like you. Your, your neighbor is the person that needs you. And, and, and there's something kind of deep here, what Jesus is saying when he tells this lawyer to go and do the same. He's saying this, that, that neighboring begins as we develop compassion and flexibility in our hearts. Like as we start to figure out who our neighbor is, like who actually is my neighbor? Is it the guy next door or is it the guy that's, that's homeless or is it my enemy? What, what, whatever we, we land on, we, we have to start in our heart to develop compassion And flexibility, otherwise we truly will never be a good neighbor. Why? Because we are always going to think about ourselves first. That's why Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Because he knows sometimes we get down on ourselves, sometimes we feel guilty, sometimes we feel shameful, but we still love ourselves. We still take care of ourselves. We still provide ourselves when we have needs. Jesus says we need to do that. And this Samaritan had compassion and he had flexibility. Now, if you were like me and you spent time growing up in church, you already have preconceived notions about the Good Samaritan. And you, you tend to look at this in a couple different ways. You tend to go, well, Jesus is saying the Samaritan is my enemy. So therefore, I need to love my enemy. I need to love those who are very different than me. I need to love those who I don't like. Or, I think more commonly, we take this and we say, actually, what Jesus is saying is that Everybody is my neighbor. Somebody say everybody. We tend to say Jesus is saying that everybody is my neighbor, so I need to go love everybody. And here's what happens. We begin to look for the loophole. 
whether we realize it or not. And we begin to say, well, you know, I opened the door for that sweet lady at the grocery store, and I got out of the way when the kid was riding his bike down the sidewalk, and I told him to be careful. And I haven't really seen anybody laying in ditches lately, so I'm doing pretty good. I'm a good neighbor. And we start, like this man, to think, okay, Jesus, I think I'm, I'm doing pretty well. But here's the problem. When everybody is your neighbor, you're aiming at everything. And when you aim at everything, what do you hit? Nothing. When you aim at everything, you hit nothing. And when everybody is your neighbor, then we end up being neighbors with nobody. Now, I want to give you a little piece of the puzzle that sometimes we miss. If you, if you know this story, we sometimes miss this. Jesus is assuming that the, Jew, the Jewish people who are listening are already doing, are already being pretty good neighbors to the Jewish people in their lives. Like Jesus gives this extreme example about the Samaritan person because the, the Jewish community was pretty tight knit. They, they took care of each other. They, they lived alongside each other. So Jesus assumes we already know how to love those that look like us and act like us and think like us. Jesus assumes we already know how to love those who live next door to us. But for you and I, we're not good at that. Let's be real. And that's what I think Jesus wants us to take away, is that sometimes your neighbor means your actual neighbor. And when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, he's also saying, you need to love the person who lives next door and behind you and across the street and upstairs or whatever your living situation looks like. He wants us to love our actual neighbors, the real people next door, with real names and real addresses and real phone numbers. Okay, so um, when you sat down, you should have had a magnet on your seat. Somebody grab that magnet and hold it up. See those magnets? You got one? Everybody got one? If not, we've got more on the back. We're going to have a little fun here, okay? So this is called a block map. Somebody say block map. This is called a block map, and that your house is right there in the middle. Now, you might say, well, I don't live in a neighborhood like this because there's no roads. Totally get it. Think about the eight houses closest to you, right? It could be in a neighborhood. Could be You might live in the country, and the next guy's a mile away. He still counts, right? You might live in a condo. The person upstairs counts. Who are the eight people closest to you? Okay, so we're going to have a little fun experiment. So if you don't have one next to you because the person next to you took it, look at the screen, and then you grab one on your way out. So here's what I want to ask. I want you to think about the eight people closest to your house, your apartment, your condo, your townhouse, whatever it may be, and I want you to think, how many of those people do you know their names? So take a second. This is guilt-free. It's a guilt-free situation. Just in your mind, take 10 seconds. I want you to count the houses around you and say the name in your head, and I want you just to count it on your fingers, okay? Ready? Go. Some of you guys are speaking out loud. I like that. All right, 10 seconds. All right, how many of you knew two of the eight? Good. How many of you guys knew four? How many of you guys knew six? How many of you guys knew eight? All right, man, I, I like it. But here's the one thing we see is it was spread all around. I actually had four. I, I, had, I had four as, as I was doing this exercise. Um, you know, this is one of those realities that sometimes we, we look at this and we think to ourselves, um, okay, maybe I don't really know my neighbors. And just so you guys know, only 10% of people who take this, um, this, this quiz know all eight, just so you guys know. And so this is one of those kind of realities. It, it, it shows us that, that we actually struggle, a lot of us, to know our actual neighbors. Some people call this the chart, the chart of shame. <laughs> don't, don't think of it as the chart of shame. Uh, we don't want you to feel shameful or guilty, but this is just a way for us to bring this idea of Jesus' great commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves into real light. That Jesus does actually want us to know our real neighbors. And so if you looked at that and you said, I only knew two, don't feel shameful, but lean in. Let that stir you up a bit. Let that drive you a little bit to do something about it. 
Now, I want to pause for a second because some of you might be wondering in your mind, okay, so Jesus calls me to be a good neighbor, but what difference can I actually make? Like, let's be honest. Sometimes in our mind, I don't want you to raise your hand, but I think a lot of us go, what difference can I actually make in somebody's life being a neighbor, right? Like, what can I actually do? But here's the reality I want to, I want to share is that most of our neighbors, just like us, are disconnected. And most of our neighbors, just like us, experience some sort of loneliness. And most of our neighbors, just like us, are tired. And most of our neighbors, just like us, want hope and peace and joy and people to love them. And most of our neighbors, just like us, want people to be there in case something happens. And most of our neighbors, just like us, want to know that somebody else cares. Could it be that God has put you in that place so you can be that person? That you can shine that light. That you can walk alongside people through the ups and downs of life. Acts chapter 17, you can turn there if you'd like. I'll put the words on the screen. Uh, The apostle Paul is, he's out on a a missionary journey. And Paul is looking to meet uh, people that kind of have a desire for God. And and try to help them see that what they're really desiring in their hearts, God has has already um, written about and told us about in Jesus. And so he goes to Acts, in Acts 17, he goes to a city called Athens. Anybody here been to Athens? Me neither, right? Me neither. So let's all go. Uh, But he goes to Athens and he's walking around. He sees all these statues of all these gods, Zeus and Artemis and all these guys. And and he sees a, a statue to an unknown god. And so he starts to speak in this really cool area called the Areopagus. And he says, hey, guys. When I was walking, I saw a, a, a statue to an unknown God. Let me tell you who this God is. And he points to the God of heaven, the God who spoke the Bible to existence. Notice what he says. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it. This is the God and the statue that you're talking about. This God who you made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in temples made by men, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling places. Did you hear that? Read that again. He says that he's determined the allotted periods and the boundaries are their, and of their dwelling places. Verse 27, that they should seek God And perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Don't miss this, guys. Paul is actually saying that God is so far ahead of us that he has put you in the neighborhood you live in, right next to the neighbor who lives next to you, so that you can be a good neighbor to them. You were like, man, I thought I just got a good deal on that house. That's how far ahead of us God is. He steps and steps and miles and miles ahead of us, interweaving all of these intersections. And God says, I put you there for a reason. See, here's the thing. When you go out and again and you ask somebody, hey, what do we need to do to fix this world? They're going to say things like, well, we've got to elect better politicians. We need better education. We need better health care. Right? They're going to say things like, we need better, we just need better programs. But the reality is that if you have been introduced to Jesus and have said yes to Jesus and have allowed Jesus to speak to you, I I think we are all starting to realize that actually the only one that can mend brokenness is Jesus. Because you can't legislate the heart. And better roads don't help people become better people. And better systems that help people who are struggling don't help people love each other. Instead, it helps people say, no, 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 this is mine. And so for our neighbors to at one point, at some point, come to know that Jesus is the mender and the way maker, they need somebody to tell them, which means that you and I have to believe it and see it and understand it. And then we have to share it with them. But the first thing Jesus calls us to do is just to be, somebody say it, good neighbors. And this is what Jesus is calling us to be. This week I was reading a story about a, a woman. I had never read her story before named Jane, Ad, Jane Adams, 2D, A-D-D-A-M-S, James Ad, Jane Adams. And she founded what's called the Whole House in Chicago in 1889. 
So what Jane realized was in Chicago, she had a lot of people moving in that were um, immigrants from Europe who didn't speak English, who had no money, who were really sick, had all these things. And she just decided she was going to start taking care of them. So she would just spend time with her neighbors next door. She would teach them English. She would help provide them with legal aid. She'd help find people to help them with housing assistance. She would help people give them financial assistance. And so eventually she turned her house into what's called the the whole house, H-U-L-L, whole. And and she was kind of a pioneer in the idea of social work. This is before the government had systems. And, And it all started because she had compassion and flexibility on the people that lived next door. One woman with a heart for people who loved her neighbor literally changed countless lives. And isn't it beautiful, don't miss this, that Jesus invites you to love the way he loved. And that is by loving in action, by loving by actually doing something for someone else, not just having good intentions to. So friends, I truly believe without knowing it, your neighbors are saying, won't you be my neighbor? And what does it look like for us to actually do that? So if you're a note taker, I've got four just simple action steps as we wrap up today that I think can really help us to take that step forward in identifying who our neighbor is and loving them in action. The first one is this, that we need to slow down and be intentional with your time. Remember that priest and that Levite? They were in too much of a hurry. That guy was there on the side of the road and they thought somebody else will get to him. Because they had a schedule to keep and they had somewhere to be. And one of the challenges we have in this world is we're all just stuck with hurry sickness. Because we're all just too busy and in too much of a hurry. How would life look differently if we actually slowed down a little bit and was intentional with our time? Don't turn there now, but if you have time later, go read John chapter 4. Really cool story. Jesus and his disciples, they're leaving Jerusalem. They're going back to Galilee. They've got their nice little road that takes them around Samaria where the bad Samaritans, the guy from the good Samaritan story, where they were from. And Jesus says, you know what? We're going to cut through Samaria. We're going to try to get home. And so they're like, man, we must be in a hurry. we got to get home, right? So they stop in Samaria, though, and they go get something to eat. Jesus goes to the well and has a conversation with the woman at the well. Jesus has a long conversation. When the disciples come back, they're like, whoa. Jesus, what are you doing? Jesus was speaking to her about heavenly things. He was speaking to her about what's the most important. Did Jesus have somewhere to be? For sure he did. But he slowed down and he was intentional with his time. That woman, she saw that Jesus was the Savior. She ran and told everybody in that whole town. Everybody in that whole town came out. Jesus spent three days there. Imagine taking three days off work. Call your boss. Hey, Just so you know, I'm going to take a few days off. I'm having some good conversations. How many of you could do that? It's hard, but Jesus did. I'm not saying you take three days off to talk to your neighbor, but what I'm saying is, what would it look like for us to slow down and be intentional, to get to know our actual neighbors, to make time, to be around our neighbors? Darren and I were joking this week like, you know, like, what would that even look like? Does it mean, like, if I see my neighbor outside, do I just walk out oddly and say something? Or do I, like, play in the dirt, you know, and, like, pretend I'm planting something, you know, and I'm looking around? Like, just don't be weird about it. Just be nice, right? <laughs> but slow down and be intentional. Number two is allow yourself to be interruptible. How many of you guys like to be interrupted? Like, none of you? Good. Because that's weird right, if you like to be interrupted. But truly, nothing is more frustrating to me than being interrupted, right? You're working on something and the kids come in and they're like, dad, dad, can I have ice cream? And I said, I told you 19 times, Hallie, no more ice cream today. (laughs) But there's something beautiful about being interrupted. Jesus was talking with a synagogue leader named Jairus in Mark chapter 5. And Jairus, his daughter was sick. She's getting ready to die. And so he, Jesus says, I'll go with you to your home. He takes Peter and, and John and James. And on the way, the, there's a woman who's struggling with the issue of blood. And she walks up and touches Jesus. And Jesus, he's, he's in a crowd. He's on a place to go. This girl's going to die. And Jesus stops. And he said, who touched me? 
And he looks back, and there's this woman who had just been healed after 12 years, spent all of her money, sick, so sick for so long. And she's weeping on the ground, and Jesus stops, and he looks at her, and he said, Daughter, you are forgiven. You are healed. Jesus allowed himself to be interrupted, and if there was one person that had somewhere to be and something to do, it was him. Why can't we allow ourselves to be a little bit more interruptible? Now, I know what some of you are saying. Look, I spend all day at work pouring myself out. I am so tired. When I get home, all I want to do is open that garage door, go inside, put on some PJs, and go watch reruns, right? I'm just trying to go watch more episodes of The Mentalist so I can just calm down. I don't want to see or talk to anybody. But Jesus says, I know, but your neighbor, they need you to talk to them. The other day I was walking outside and I was convicted that I only knew four of my neighbor's names. And so my neighbor who, you know, I know some of, same, same as you guys, you might only know four neighbor's names, but then you know that neighbor, right? Like the one with the blonde hair that you always say hi to, right? Well, she was walking down the street. And so I awkwardly stood around my Jeep like I was getting something out of it, you know, and I'm dancing around. And, and she walks by, and I'm like, hey, you know, I see you like every day. And I don't think I've ever introduced myself. Hey, I'm Drew. And she says, hey, I'm Rhonda. I was like, nice to meet you, Rhonda. Have a good day. And so Rhonda went away. And then I was like, Rhonda, 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 <laughs> Rhonda, Rhonda. So I got five now. I got five on my list. And I know you guys can do the same too. Allow yourself to be interruptible. When you see your neighbor, just go say, hey. Third one is this. Don't let fear distort your perspective. This is a big one, guys. In Numbers 13, the, the, the uh, Hebrews are coming through to the promised land, the, pro the land that God had promised to uh, their, their ancestors. And, and so they come to this promised land, and Moses sends out 12 that called them spies, like surveyors, right? They had the big sticks and the thing. They stood in the middle of the road, and they were looking around. And so these 12 spies, they go around, and they look, and they come back and report and 10 of them say, man, we can't go because those Canaanites are like giants and we're like grasshoppers. And Caleb and Joshua are like, no, 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 God's going God's to gonna make a way. And the other 10 said no. And what did the people do? They got scared and they fell back. And they did not enter into this new home that God had prepared for them. See, sometimes fear causes us to say, man, those are giants and I'm just a grasshopper. Like, my neighbors don't want to hear from me. My neighbors don't want to know me. My neighbor's way cooler than I am. My, my neighbors, they don't know, really care about my faith, or they don't really care about my friendship, or I don't know what to say. Could God be saying, don't let fear stop you. Just be a good neighbor. If at anything, your neighbor just needs you to be a good neighbor. And number four, last one here, if you're taking notes, is, Take the next small step. Sometimes we think that to be good neighbors, to love on our neighbor, we have to do these huge things. Like, like we have to go preach at some giant stadium, or we have to cold call our entire neighbor, or make fresh baked cookies for the entire neighborhood. But when Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28 to go, he literally just said, go. Take the next small step. See, for a lot of us, it might be Hold those cards up again. You guys got them? Hold that block map up. For a lot of us, it might be, take a while and fill out your block map. Find reasons to get to know the neighbor that you always wave to and you don't know their name yet. Or the new guy that moved in behind you. Take them something, some cookies or a queso or whatever. Bring me some queso too if you're going to take your neighbor queso. But really, take the next small step and so I, I think that's where I want to I want to kind of end this is I want to just challenge you guys over these next eight weeks we're going to just spend time just really unpacking I, I really encourage you guys be here for every all these eight weeks if you've got to miss or whatever watch online because we're going to unpack what does it look like to actually get to know our neighbor what does it look like to bless our neighbor by just caring for them being there for them helping walk through the hard times of life for them because we truly believe that when you know Jesus, your life changes. 
Not only does your eternal destination change, but your day-to-day changes. You have the ability to walk through life with joy and peace and hope. You have the ability to work through the difficult valleys of life. It doesn't mean that life's going to be rosy and full of rainbows and, and, and lollipops, but it does mean you got people that are going to walk through this stuff with you and help you to see that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. I'm going to challenge you guys over these next, next eight weeks. I'd like for you to, I'm going to do the same. Because I'm not, I'm not 100% on this at all. But I think God is calling us to be good neighbors. So let's fill out our cards. Let's put that on your fridge at home. And as you meet and as you go, write your neighbor's name down. How beautiful would it be if you knew every one of your neighbors by name and you knew something about your neighbor too? See, I think Jesus, guys, if you feel a little tension inside of you, it's because it's a good, it's a godly tension. God is calling us to be good neighbors. He wants us to know our neighbors. He wants us to know them well enough so when something happens, we can be there. When something happens for you, they can be there for you. And I know some of us in this room, we might feel a little bit convicted that we don't know our neighbors better. And so I don't want you to feel shame or guilt. I want you to feel excitement because this is a new journey we're going to be on together. So I'm going to ask you right now for commitment. Who here is going to join us to know our neighbors? Who here is going to join us to get to know the people next to us? I want to pray for you. Would you pray with me? Father, I just thank you for Everybody here today who says, I want to be a good neighbor. I want to be able to love on my neighbor, to care for my neighbor, to help my neighbor, to be there and to encourage my neighbor. And Lord, if the time is right, help me to share the truth that's changed our lives, that you are so, so good, that you are the one and only, the way, the truth, and the life who saves us from our sin, who saves us from guilt and shame, and who allows us to walk a life of peace and hope and forgiveness. And that's not found in trying to be good or it's not found in trying to do all these things to earn your favor, but it's found in trusting you and following you. So, Father, I pray for everyone in this room, Lord, give us the desire to be good neighbors. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you're here today and you feel this tug on your heart and you say, you know, when you talk about peace and hope and love, I've never experienced that before. I want you to know you can. And it's not easy, but it's simple. It's difficult because we, we we have to make the commitment to say yes to turning away from us and turning to Jesus. But it's incredibly simple because Jesus just says, turn to me. So while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you say today is the day I want to say yes to Jesus, I want to say a quick prayer. And it's not the words of the prayer that save you, but it's the heart behind the prayer. And if you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, Jesus says you will be saved and he will give you new life and you will be able to walk in the beauty and the joy and the forgiveness of God's grace. So you can say these words quietly in your mind or you can can pray them out loud if you'd like, but if you want to say yes to Jesus today or recommit your life to Jesus, say these words after me. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I turn from thinking my way is best. Jesus, show me the way. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And be my Savior. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if that's you today and you say, I want to say yes to Jesus for the first time, I prayed that prayer, or I am committing my life to Jesus again because I've strayed, would you just put a hand in the air? Amen. I see you on the left. I see you right here in the front. Anyone else today? I want to pray for you. Father, I I just pray for those that put their hands in the air today to to say yes to you for the very first time and to recommit their faith to you, Lord, that you help speak to their hearts for them to know that they are yours, 
that you have set their life on a path of meaning and value, and that you call them your son, your daughters, because you love them so much. You sent Jesus here for us. Help us to live in a way that honors you and to be good neighbors to those all around us. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.